Yeah, so anyway, um, this is my first time at IFL. I was told to present a uh, work in progress. And I might have taken that a bit too literally because I was thinking with a slight return with introduction. So some of this stuff is going to be new to me too. I'm looking forward to it. So a bit of context. I'm from the first Initiative for Climate Impact Research. That might be an exotic location for you. So uh, what do we do there? This is from the PIC mission from the web uh, site of PIC. Generate interdisciplinary insights and provide society with sound information for decision making. How do we do that? Systems and scenario analysis, modeling, computer simulations, data integration, but mostly computer simulation. This is not new or specific in any way to climate impact research. This is ubiquitous today everywhere in science. So much so that Axelrod of the Prisoner's Dilemma fame, you might have heard of him, has identified computer simulation as a third way of doing science uh, in addition to the traditional deduction and induction. So, like deductions, computer simulations are based on explicit assumptions. But instead of trying to analyze these explicit assumptions analytically, what we do is we inspect massive amounts of data just as when we are doing empirical science. But this data is not observed in nature, but rather derived from a rigorously specified set of rules, which is probably the computer program. So the correctness of a computer simulation is therefore given by, you know, explicit assumptions, rigorous rules to generate the data, the computer program, and presumably some relationship between them. Axelrod doesn't say that. I don't know why. Maybe it's obvious. Let's see. So this is a rather notorious example. Um, in 2006-2007, Herbert Gintz, is a famous economist, announced the discovery of a new price formation mechanism. How prices arise is a deep, important problem in economics. And he showed a way in which prices could arise, which was better than the traditional ways we, we have, which impose all sorts of dubious assumptions, right? And his work is a textbook example of computer simulation. He says our work is empirical, not theoretical. We have created a class of economies. You cannot do that in real life, right? So these were computer programs. This was very important. Price formation is very important. We had this project at PIC, the Lagom project, which has a model of Germany that has been used, right? So this is, um, uh, in, in, you see, in assessing economic implications of German climate policy, designing sustainable answers to the financial crisis. I don't know what weight these simulations have, but they must have some weight. We get paid for them, right? So it's important that they are correct. So the ideas of Gintis were very exciting. But because we have a certain responsibility due to the usage of these models, we tried to uh, analyze them analytically, see if we could really prove analytically that this price mechanism um, really works. And indeed, two of my colleagues managed to show that that is the case, but under much stronger assumptions. So our attempts to replicate the model failed. And because this was such a big deal, independently from us, unknown to us, although we have this collaboration with Patti Kenson from Chatworth, two other students independently analyzed this model as well. They also failed to reproduce the results. We asked Intis for the source code, and we found independently this rather clear bug, right? Uh, so a proportional uh, was implemented by a constant. So of course, things <laughs> converge faster when there's no variation. <laughs> that wasn't the biggest problem, right? We still, after fixing this, we still didn't get the behavior we were seeing. And it turns out that the main problem was that the clear description that was given in the paper was ambiguous. It did not match the, let's say, rigorously specified rules for generating the data implemented in the program, right? So there was this big discrepancy, and therefore we couldn't replicate the results. These are quotes from published work. 
So we need specifications. We need to tie up these two things, the hypothesis and the uh, rules that give you the data, right? And we want to do this because nowadays, as I said, this is very common. And computer simulations play largely the role of laboratory experiments. And these are the things that we're supposed to replicate, to verify, to check, right? Otherwise, the results are going to be insubstantiated. So we look around in the literature, right? There's, for example, this book, big book, Writing Scientific Software, A Guide to Good Style. It doesn't mention specifications, right? Maybe they're not good style. Uh, the problem is, I think I know why. It's because the mathematical description serves a specification. But as we've seen, it doesn't do the job. The distance between the mathematics and the implementation is too big. The mathematics is usually continuous in the scientific programming context. Real analysis, that sort of thing. You need to discretize functions to integrate them, to integrate partial differential equations. Different discretizations, different properties, different results. For performance reasons, programmers will usually twist the algorithm in different ways, and so on. So, sooner or later, everybody who comes to tackle this problem is going to come across constructive mathematics and Martin Lewis type theory. And look what he says. This is 1984, a programmatic article, very well known. The aim of constructive mathematics is to the cleavage between mathematics, classical mathematics, that is, and programming that we are witnessing at present disappears. Ah. He also mentions specifications explicitly, right? So type theory is not just a programming language, but also a specification notation, provides notation for the tasks. The correctness of a program is proved formally at the same time as it is being synthesized. Very nice. Well, can we use this to form, to specify the programs that we are encountering? And we start with economic models, because they are used everywhere in this kind of uh, um, integrated analysis, right? So let's see if we can formalize basic concepts of economics. Now, I won't have time to delve much into economics. I'm sorry for that. But there's a typical example. You know, two agents, they've got each two endowments, the two kinds of goods, right? Say, beer and wine. And one of the agents likes beer better than wine. And the other agent likes wine better than beer. And they start with an initial endowment, so each one of them has a certain quantity of wine and beer. And then they exchange, they trade. So after some trades, what would you expect them to have? You know, so I would expect personally the guy who likes beer more to have more bottles of beer than he started out with. And the same for the guy who likes wine. So this is the formalization of this situation. This is the uh, main simple model of economics, right? Models of exchange, many agents, many goods, they trade to get a better allocation. They start from an initial allocation, which means each agent has some endowment, and they trade to get a better allocation. So logically speaking, they are going to keep on trading if there is an allocation that is better for everybody. So what we expect from an allocation when we see that no more trading occurs is that there is no allocation which is better for everybody. And this is called weak Pareto efficiency. And this is taken ad literum from, from Varian, which is the textbook for uh, economics, for macroeconomics. So you can see the, the definition. And then we would like to formalize this, right? And there are these concepts, allocation, right? So an allocation is the set of endowments. Each agent has an endowment. This makes up an allocation. An allocation has to be feasible. That means no goods are created or destroyed in the process of trade. We need some form of agent. And we need this predicate, three-place predicate that agents strictly prefer so. An agent strictly prefers an allocation to another. So then this is the formalization. 
I mean, weak Pareto efficiency is a property of allocations. And you can see this. An allocation x is weakly Pareto efficient if it is feasible and it is not the case that there exists another allocation x prime which is also feasible and preferred by all agents to x. This is an ad literal translation. Everybody can do it, right? So at least everybody can read it. <laughs> I've tested this kind of thing. I've tested with some exercise, with some exercise. I've tested this things with high school students. They love it. More complicated things, right? So Pareto efficient allocations are hard to find because they are things that depend on the relationship between many agents. So there was this brilliant idea. What if there were prices? Then, because each agent has an initial endowment, it's like each agent has a budget. Then, each agent solves his own optimization problem. What would I like best <coughs> with this budget? Lots of beer and some wine. No relation to the others, right? Now, if there is a set of prices which is just so select that every agent solving this optimization problem for itself gets the best and the resulting allocation is feasible, that's a very good situation indeed. So such a miraculous set of prices P together with an allocation X, which is such that every agent does at these prices, the best that it can do is called a Valbrasian equilibrium. This was a fundamental idea in economics. And its importance is also due to this introduction of prices, which initially seems like a mathematical trick. Let's try to make an untractable problem, finding Pareto Optima, tractable. Right? Very interesting. And this gives prices a significance which is different from the competing Marxist theory which says that prices have to do something with the labor uh, invested in the product. Now this is desirability of the product. Very important. Okay, so in formalizing this we replace a little bit this condition uh, by our feasibility predicate. Uh, you see that here preferences are on endowments, but in the Pareto case, preferences are on allocations. So here, preferences, in fact, are also on allocations. It's just that they are decided by the endowments. So, uh, uh, putting things in word, it just says that x is uh, at price is p Bayesian equilibrium. If there is no other, if if any other thing which is preferred by an agent is going to be out of budget for that agent. That agent would have to pay more than it has. So we need these things, prices, values, the, a, a way of uh, uh, deciding the value of an endowment at a price, comparing values, and of course, omega, the initial allocation. <coughs> and then again, you can see this is literal translation. XP is a reason <coughs> equilibrium if it's feasible, and if for all agents, for all allocations, if an agent strictly prefers that allocation, then that allocation is for the agent out of budget. Very easy, you see what I mean. Once you do this, you start asking all sorts of questions. For example, Bayesian equilibrium, this brilliant optimal pair allocation prices, is it in budget? itself? Can agents afford this optimal allocation? This is the most used textbook in economics. It's the classic. It's, it's, it, we don't have a classic like that in computer science. Right? And they were all very surprised when we were reading together in front. Does, is the optimal allocation affordable for the agents? Not necessary. No. The optimal allocation can be out of budget. Interesting. You can prove easily that Valerian equilibrium is indeed for it uh, efficient. So uh, you need some additional machinery. Uh, I've got the code I could show it to you, but I don't have time. Um, we have 
This is also a program, if you want, for converting a machinery that computes Barrazian equilibria into Pareto uh, computation. Now, this was a very good place to start because it turns out that all mainstream models are just refinements of this idea. Right? If you have more agents, you have agents that you can have good creation, you can have good consumption. Uh, among the goods you can have is labor, you can have a labor market, you can have credit, you can have banks, you can have government regulations. Many steps instead of just one step of trading and so on, but everything is within this frame. It's a, it, again, it's a good place to start, not a good place to end. But. So, good news. We, 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 we did this together with economists. We formalized lots of, lots of these equilibria, lots of the main concepts, lots of the main theorems. We, 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 uh, we formalized Nash, we formalized correlated equilibria, which have been introduced by Albert, um, many of these things. Uh, we have specified uh, agents in the in this kind of framework, which is not this kind of framework, and people who developed the Lagom model have participated, and they found this understandable, right? This they found this, they, they they could deal with it, they could see it immediately. It's not more difficult than learning uh, UML or something. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the explicit hypothesis. We have the rules that drive our simulations, but we don't have them. So all these things are actually not constructed. So you can specify very well that you have a machinery that gives you Pareto optimized, you give it Barrazian equilibria, but you're never going to get a Barrazian equilibria in general because optimization is not constructed. Moreover, you're not going to have these things provably correct because people use external routines <laughs> about which you can only say what they, what you think they do, but you have no proofs for them. You might be able to do better if you have the library for constructive reals, but we don't. Now, every time you write a dependently type program and pro, uh, programs, you have to do some proofs. These proofs, however, have to be constructed, not just formal, but constructed. And people are to a degree willing to give proofs of correctness of programs, especially in contexts where it's important. They are less willing to give formal proofs of correctness of programs, but they sure as hell are willing to give constructive formal <laughs> proofs of correctness. I think that's not so bad. We have now this explicit hypothesis there in the code. They are at least checked for syntactic correctness. But moreover, some of these things you can implement. And moreover, some of these things you are going to be able to use, and so on. So I think that we can do better and better and better. I'm not talking about things in the big thing, right? So I'm talking about small things. For example, this has been shown by uh, Ken yesterday. These are bounded numbers. And you can imagine that the typical thing is trying to compute the maximum of a utility function or up to a certain number n, right? So this would be the specification of this max function, right? So no other number is going to have a bigger utility than what this max uh, function spits up. So a person who comes from the Haskell world or from the C world or from the Java world is going to write this kind of program, which I think is fairly straightforward, right? So we don't want to do this kind of, we want to do tail recursive calls, so we have this parameter that tells us whether we should count up on and on. And then we, we, do, we look at this parameter and then we see, do we need to count up? If we need to count up, we count up. We see if we've got something better. If we've got something better, this is our new candidate. And then we see, are we at the end? If we are at the end, then we return whatever we found best so far. And if we're not at the end, then we do one more step. I think this program, first of all, passes, I mean, if you, if you pop and cut and paste it in Haskell, it goes through without any problems, it's fairly reasonable, and it's straightforward. And that is not Haskell. <laughs> Neither is it. So this bombs. It doesn't pass the type checker. Why doesn't it pass the type checker? Because the C there, we can have signaled with a band, uh, uh, has the property that, that it's, it's of, it's of 
the wrong type. It's of type bounded by n instead of being bounded by the successor of n. So the type shifter says, I don't believe you can increment this and still stay within the successor of n bound. But I know I can increment it because I just test it here. You see the biggest one? If it's not the biggest one, then I know I can increment it. Right? The compiler doesn't believe. So I, if I want to write a cast function, I cannot write a cast function because I run into the same problem. It doesn't believe me. So that's not good. So here is the solution. Coerced. It's actually unsafe coerced, but it doesn't fit in slide where it is. It was saying it's too, too long. So I'm going to coerce this. This is I, I, this just makes the compiler happy and is implemented internally, as you can see, by the identity function. I'm telling you this is all that you can increment it. Trust me. So I think, although most dependency type programmers that I have shown this to have thought this is like a anathema to them, it's not so bad. Somebody should, the people who write dependency type programs and try to take advantage of this specification machinery should be allowed to do this. And people who are more in the know in this thing, have more experience, can then look at these critical places and improve them. This brings me to like, the last thing, programming style. You might be surprised, but dependency type Programming style is also not a topic in writing scientific software good style. <laughs> so we don't know much about it, right? So I, there are these two styles. The first one is Nordstrom Metallis presented in programming in Martin Lev's type theory. It says, if you want to specify a function from x to y, which has a certain property r, then that's what you do. You say f takes an x and delivers a y such that the relation holds. Thompson says, no, 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 no. If you want to do that, then you specify, you give a function f such that for every x, the relation r holds between x and the moment. This makes it easier to do proofs. Some proofs are not going to be possible in this framework, just like the, the, the max example that I was giving you, right? It's a struggle to get people who are naturally inclined towards this to go through that. But I think, in general even, it's not going to be possible to do this because we have all these external routines, right? So let me just keep ahead. And so there's, as you can see, there's lots of future work that we can do, right? I think putting types on these external routines, just saying what they're supposed to do, is very important. Using this type here, this dependency type programming languages as glue that says this is supposed to do that, this is supposed to do that, therefore the result does that, is going to be very important. We can develop DSLs to help people use these things. And the idea is what we want is increasingly correct scientific I'm not claiming we're doing correct scientific computing, right? Just let's do a bit better. Then. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions on your example. Um, so the first one is, um, so what you've done here is you've used fin, which is great, uh, because it's a dependent type and it's very useful if you want to look up stuff in a vector. That's the standard example. Um, but it's not so great if you want to do arithmetic, because you have these problems that you want to add one to it, and then you realize is it in bounds or not, and then you have to write these checks. So. In this kind of example, isn't it better to just work with natural numbers paired with a proof? And then uh, if you have one person who just writes the program, they can worry about how, what the operations are on the natural numbers. And the person who fills in the proof uh, can make sure that the details are, are all correct. Isn't that a better way to model this then? Uh, it might be. So at the moment, um, one of my colleagues is attempting this design. Yeah. But I have my attempts at this design mm -hmm. have kind of failed. Okay. So the, the problem is that these proof obligations propagate. Yes. And they are going to get. And I have found that they they, they propagate uh, much faster than 
you would expect. Mm -hmm. Coupled with the implicit naming <coughs> mechanism that Idris and Agda have, mm -hmm. that means that you're all sorts, all, always going to have to give all sorts of implicit explicitly and you run into all sorts of yep. troubles. But Finns, I like, you know, Finns yeah. are the killer application <laughs> of dependent type sure, sure. program. <laughs> And so, but you know the solution, presumably, is that... I, I do. I okay, do. I, so, I, I, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. No, I, I, I do. But this is a real-life example. Yeah. So, yeah. Which it's not chosen for, for beauty or yeah. Yeah. as a model. Sorry. Any other questions? So, I was struck by the, you, you, this Nordstrom and Thompson comparison you did. So, uh, you, you know my student, uh, Josh Coe, is... Uh, doing the same kind of thing for data types. You can, you can have the type constraints um, hardwired into the data type and it's then clearer what's going on, but it's much more difficult to combine that with the existing libraries of data types. Alternatively, you can have the plain ordinary data type and the, the, the separate proof. It's the same story, right? Yes, it's yes, story. yes. So, in fact, so this, um, uh, there's an article of Thompson that makes this, this distinction very clearly. But uh, I've been talking with Connor, yeah. and it's exactly what you're saying. So the yeah. problem is either you have a simple data structure, lots of functions that operate, but require, and this, his solution is this ornamentation. Yeah. Or some sort of boot up. What Connor is trying to do at the moment, which is very interesting, is adding more reflective capability. If you have more reflective capability, you're in the clear. Because then you can look at this function and say, I can take it apart from inside the code and prove everything I need about it. Without that, we are going to have exactly this problem. Okay, let's stop there.